Thank you, everybody. Hello. Um, uh, so I'm also the uh, co-founder and CEO of Sick Weather, uh, but I'm also a former resident of Tower D here at Towson University. Thank you. Of course, that was back when it was called Towson State University, and President Dr. Marvin Lesky was the head of the theater department, in which I was a theater major. Now, I'm a bit chagrined to say that I am a college dropout. I left Towson after failing my theater movement class. <laughs> And I lost my scholarship. And for those of you who don't know, the movement class is literally a class about how to move on stage, which apparently I couldn't do very well. Um, but right now, I'm showing perfect stance. Uh, I'm, I'm talking with my hands. I'm not too grounded when I walk. So I just want to say that the prodigal son has returned. Uh, <laughs> and I, not only have I come full circle by being here tonight, but my company, Sick Weather, is now an associate member of the Towson Global Incubator. Um, thank you. But I'm not here to encourage students to drop out. After all, by doing so, it has taken me nearly 20 years and thousands of miles to basically travel the distance of Tower D to here uh, in this auditorium tonight, which perhaps I could have, uh, with a degree, I could have done in half that time. I instead, I mention this to make an example of myself as it relates to this popular diagram of success, which most of you are probably familiar with. On the left, we have the perceived idea of what success looks like. And on the right, we see that the, the reality is much more complicated, which is very true of my experience with starting sick weather. By way of another example, on the left is a photo of me with my co-founders, James Sager and Michael Belt, posing for a reporter looking like we're in the opening credits of like a sitcom, maybe. Uh, on the right is us in the same office during an actual development meeting. You'll notice that the photo is poorly lit, it's blurry, there's a mess of food on the table, and no one looks particularly happy. And there's, uh, and there's other people in the photo because it takes more than just the founders to build a company. And lastly, you may notice that I'm not even in the photo because somebody had to take the picture. <laughs> so as discouraging as that picture of success may seem, that doesn't even take into account the fact that most of the time when people have an idea to start something, they don't even do it. And inevitably, somebody else comes along and starts on that path. Um, so in this case, you know, you, uh, you know, the, the most common scenario, you have an idea and then it just kind of dwindles off and you never do anything, whereas then somebody else goes on and, and, and achieves, you know, the same idea. So our own story as a company started about two and a half years ago. I had a stomach virus, but at the time I didn't know if it was food poisoning or perhaps uh, just something that was going around. So during one of my respites from the bug, I went on Facebook to see if any of my friends were talking about the same symptoms. I did this because I had become accustomed, like many of you, to seeing posts from my friends about whatever illness they or their kids had. So I'm on Facebook and I see a friend in DC who's talking about the same symptoms. And at once it dawned on me that what I was doing could be done on a much larger scale using the APIs for Facebook and Twitter. And that perhaps with that data, I could build a map of illness for anyone to see what's going around in their neighborhood at any given time. And what, I, and what did I do with this great idea? I did what most people do. I did nothing. I sat on it. And then I mentioned it one day at a party to my uh, friend and co-founder, Michael Belt, who was a software developer. And uh, he thought it was a great idea, and he wanted to help out too, and then we both sat on it together for about another two months. And it wasn't until I happened to have dinner with my friend, James Sager, who's also our co-founder here tonight, and I told him about the idea, and he was, especially, he was especially excited about it, maybe even more excited than I was. And his excitement made us even more excited and helped us to sort of push ourselves to keep going. And we finally formed the company and launched our beta site in November of 2011. So what we developed was a patent pending process that distills data from Facebook and Twitter to generate real-time weather maps of illnesses. So for the first time ever, you can see what's actually going around in your area from a country level all the way down to a street level. And we're able to do this by filtering tweets and Facebook updates to qualify statements like, I have the flu, or my kid has a high fever, and to disqualify flu, uh, tweets like, OMG, I love Justin Bieber, Bieber fever forever. And when we have the location uh, information with the uh, uh, update or tweet, we can then plot it on a map. And here is an animation created by a contributor 
named Chris Wong, who used our data to create a time-lapse animation of reports of flu in the U.S. from October to January, which shows the height of flu season this past year. And as we hit December, you'll start to see it close a little extra brighter. So back in October, when we first noticed uh, that social media reports of flu were starting to appear in greater volume compared to our data from the year before, we tweeted about it. And six weeks later, the CDC issued a statement that we were indeed experiencing an early flu season. And it turned out to be the earliest flu season in almost a decade. This was a huge milestone for us and for, the, and for building the case to use anecdotal data from social media to track illness, since up to that point, it was mostly considered novel and not taken very seriously. But it really shouldn't have surprised anyone, since our own advisors from Johns Hopkins University, Professor Mark Dredzi and PhD student Michael Paul, published this graph of their own findings the year before after analyzing over 2 billion tweets to compare, flu, uh, to compare reports of flu to CDC's flu data. And you can see it's remarkably close. The main difference being that social media can be analyzed in real time and therefore provide an early warning system for outbreaks. Which is, especially, which is especially important for the future of public health and disease surveillance. When according to the US Census, uh, between 2001 and 2010, visits to the doctor by individuals went down by about 19%. And it wasn't because everyone suddenly got healthier. So how can we effectively track illness if we're only looking at clinical data, but less people aren't getting diagnosed by a medical professional? Meanwhile, social media adoption rates continue to rise about 40% each year. With that increased scale at which we can collect this data, we can start to build real-time health graph of our world and bridge the gap between the anecdotal and the clinical. That's the direction that we're heading in, along with many other researchers who are now taking uh, this data a lot more seriously. As for Sick Weather as a company, we are still very much in our journey. But in 2012, we were named among Entrepreneur Magazine's 100 Brilliant Companies. We were featured on the Today Show, and just earlier this year, we received our first check from advertising revenue from what we call our symptom-targeted ads. And we're excited to see where the next six months will take us as members of the Towson Global Incubator. <clears throat> now, finally, I want to share with you why my friend and co-founder, James Sager, on the far right here, was so excited and driven to make sick weather a reality. In his own journey, he found himself moving back to Maryland to care for his ailing mother who was battling cancer. And while she was going through chemotherapy, he had to do everything he could to keep himself from getting sick. He avoided crowds, uh, peak hours at restaurants, and if he wanted to see his friends, he would call ahead to see if our kids were sick. The concept of having a real-time source of information about what's going on around him would have been a welcome convenience uh, during that time. And suddenly, this relatively novel idea of using social media to track illness had much more gravity and relevance to all of us. So I'd like to dedicate this presentation to his mother, Nalinda Sager, who, who may have lost her battle with cancer, but whose influence lives on in her family and in our company. Thank you. <laughs>